From the blues to hip hop, African Americans have driven sonic innovation for more than a century. While styles have changed, there's one sound that's remained constant, a source of strength and courage, comfort and wisdom. Gospel. That's a little bit of gospel. Gospel music is soul. Gospel music is R&B. Gospel music is funk. It's hip hop. Gospel music is the full spectrum in terms of its sound of black music and beyond. Mahalia Jackson, mm -hmm. what was special about her voice? She believed every word she was singing. Mm -hmm.
mission of the March of Washington Film Festival is to tell the mistold and untold stories of the civil rights movement, particularly the movement from the mid 1950s to the late. The mission of the March of Washington Film Festival is to tell the mistold and untold stories of the civil rights movement, particularly the movement from the mid 1950s to the late 1960s. We want to uplift the icons, the well-known folks, and the foot soldiers, the everyday people who populated and moved the civil rights movement forward. Well, I was literally inspired uh, by a trip that I took with Congressman John Lewis. He had an annual trip to Alabama, Mississippi, where I used to live as a young person. And in touring the civil rights sites, my attention was caught by an older woman who was an usher at one of the churches and I had a conversation with her about what it was like for her and it got me thinking that change is made by thousands of people, not just icons. And we decided to show films about the battle soldiers, the sort of the rank and file citizens who come together and make change. That was the inspiration. Our history is consciously mistold and we have to really fight and come together to create platforms so that people who know our history can have more honest conversations. And, and in this case, it's through art and narrative form. Since the founding of the festival, we have expanded on what we do as an organization. So we have year round events. We have our annual big festival in the fall. We do events every month or so around either an author or a film or a theme like February, um, African American History Month, March Women's History Month, etc. We also have a student and emerging filmmaker competition so that we encourage emerging filmmakers and student filmmakers who are addressing issues around civil rights or social justice to share their short films. This year we're starting a new program called Imagining Equity where we help high school students, juniors and seniors, and their teachers use their phones to create social justice films. One of the things I think is unique about our festival is that we incorporate the visual and performing arts along with scholarship. So it's more than films and more than panels. Uh, we do virtual presentations. We have people speak on a particular subject. We have had art exhibits and spoken word performances and dance. Uh, we've put together musical performances around some of the important and unknown history of the movement. We let storytellers be storytellers. Um, the world is filled with people with a story. We all have a story. So we rely on people from all over the country, in fact, all over the world now, to come tell us their story. And our job is to find the resources and the infrastructure and the audience so that they can connect and tell that story. Our history needs to be told accurately, and the March on Washington Festival is an important platform to do that. Festival closing night program at Duke Ellington School of the Arts. Here to present the awards to the 2023 winners of the March on Washington Film Festival Student and Emerging Filmmaker Competition is the curator and programmer, Opal Hope Bennett. Good evening. Thank you all for joining us this evening and uh, we thank you so much for your patience with our late start. We are an all student run event this evening and our student producers were doing a wonderful job trying to put out some fires in the back. So please give them a round of applause. It's my great honor to be with you tonight the student and emerging shorts competitions are in their eighth year, and they continue to be a great forum for new voices in filmmaking who are the dissenters, asking the hard questions, forwarding the different takes, and speaking truth to power. And now, without further ado, this year's jury award winners. First up, the runners up, who will each receive a $500 cash prize, and $250 in film equipment. <laughs> Not bad, right? <laughs> the student narrative runner-up 
is Go Danny Go by Chelsea Ramirez. Fortunately, Chelsea couldn't join us, but uh, thank you for your applause. The student doc runner-up is Grandpa Cherry Blossom by Maddox Chen. Are you here with us, Maddox? All right, come on up, come on up. Our emerging narrative runner-up is Here by James Anthony. Our emerging doc runner-up is Black Strings by Marquise Mays. And now our grand prize winners who will each receive a $1,000 cash prize, $500 worth of film equipment, and $500 towards their trip to DC to join us this evening. Yeah, thank you. The Student Narrative Grand Prize goes to Of Silence and Song by Lei Dai. The student doc grand prize goes to Majie Uchebike. I am more dangerous dead. Emerging Narrative Grand Prize goes to Sueños de Mi Hija by Cecilia Roma. And last but not least, the Emerging Documentary Grand Prize goes to Troubled Waters by Sydney Heslop.
Lord. Always got to be a little fumble. Uh, so the festival would like to announce an additional um, addition to the prizes, an additional addition. This was just donated today um, by a wonderful friend of the, fa of the festival. Um, and I'm very pleased to announce that all of the eight prize recipients will receive an additional cash prize of $1,000 from the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Thanks to our friends at the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Thank you so very much. And thank you. Enjoy the show. And now, please welcome the founder of the March on Washington Film Festival, Robert Rabin. Good evening. Thank you, Duke Ellington, for having us. This is a student-run production. The March on Washington Festival is partnering uh, with Duke Ellington, and the students here are running the tech and the timing and the lights, and we're just so, so excited to see their talent uh, and their professionalism. This is going to be an amazing evening of inspiration and scholarship and music. So we're all in for an incredible treat. Tonight is brought to us by an incredible supporter of the uh, March on Washington Festival, Tiffany Sanchez and her incredible family. If we could thank them for their steadfast support. <laughs> Tiffany and family, if you'd like to stand, that would be great. We'd love to recognize you. <laughs> we work on this festival because our history is purposefully mistold. <laughs> Through art and film and scholarship and student engagement, we do our part for eight years physically in the DMV and now online and physical all over the world. People can avail themselves of stories that tell our history more accurately, narrative, documentary, art, dance, the use of textiles, whatever it is that people rely on to communicate. And our goal is to connect our past to our future and to ask everybody, and particularly the young people, what is your civil right? What do you want to focus on? One of the programs we are most proud of is called Imagining Equity. The superintendent of schools in Seattle approached us and said, what if we had a high school curriculum where students could learn social justice filmmaking. Apparently, that doesn't exist anywhere in the country. Fast forward, we've raised about $300,000. You know, you know where this is going. You know there's a QR code on your fan. Those of you, is anyone here from Mount Enon tonight? Yes, well, we're going to press down and shake together and do that thing that the pastor tells us to do, but just in a minute. We raised about $300,000 and worked with USC, University of Southern California School of Film, UCLA School of Education, and they designed the nation's first high school curriculum for social justice filmmaking in Los Angeles School. How many Darnella Frasers? How many stories could connect if young people knew that there's an audience for them, and there is an audience for them. So we are in our first year in Los Angeles, 200 students. We are doing our best to make sure that Prince George's County and D.C. are the second and third jurisdictions that have this. But guess what, saints? We're going to invite you now and throughout the evening when you're inspired to use your phone and do the QR code and give what you can so that thousands of students around the nation can avail themselves of this curriculum 
and turn into the student and emerging filmmakers that you just saw and become the Sam Pollards and the Raul Pecks and the Don Porters and the Lisa Cortezes who tell our history more accurately. God bless you all. Thank you for coming and do enjoy the program. On June 12, 1963, Medgar Evers, the first field secretary of the Mississippi NAACP, was shot and killed in her driveway, in his driveway. His death shocked the nation and galvanized the civil rights movement. Here now is the voice of civil rights, voting rights, and Mississippi Freedom Party organizer Fannie Lou Hamer, recounting that fateful night as interpreted by dancer and choreographer Israel PTG. I remember 10 years ago today as I had walked about 10 or 12 feet out of Winona Jail, Reverend James Belvey informed me that Metka Evers had been shot in the back. It was six of us that had gotten out of jail in Winona. Some of us weren't able to sit down. But I keep saying, Burley, and keep asking God to hold my hand, Charlie Evers, because I know if he hold my hand, everything will be all right. Precious Lord, take my Take my hand 
would like to say, Evers and Burley, every one of these days that you meet is not going to be sunshiny days. There are going to be sunshine and it's going to be rain. And it's going to be bright days and there are going to be some dark days. And whenever we are having these days, I just say, when the dark is a prayer, precious Lord, linger near. Oh, when my day is past, I'm gone at the river. Oh, here I stand. God, my feet. Hold my hand, take my hand, precious Lord, and leave your child. We now proudly present the Duke Ellington School of the Arts Concert Choir, accompanied by Patrick Lundy and the Ministers of Music.
Now please welcome the artistic director of the March on Washington Film Festival, Isisara Bay, followed by the esteemed principal of Duke Ellington School of the Arts, Sandy M. Logan. Giving praise to the source of all life and honor to the seven directions, north, south, east, west, above, below, and within. And to the cycle of life of African ancestored peoples, those who've gone on before, those living and those yet to be born. Because they were, we are. Because we are, they will be. It is my pleasure to welcome you to the Pulpits, Protest, and Power Live event of the March on Washington Film Festival. Tonight is the penultimate event of our festival, and it encapsulates this year's theme in the ways we love best. Using scholarship and the visual and performing arts to lift up the powerful stories, icons, and foot soldiers of the civil rights movement and connect them to contemporary activism here and abroad. This is our festival's first multi-day collaboration with a school and we could not have picked a, picked a better one than Ellington. <laughs> Our teams have melded together seamlessly and everyone, students, faculty, and staff alike, have given their all. Between the screening of the documentary, Going to Mars, the Nikki Giovanni Project, the two-day virtual reality pop-up salon, and the students who are performing as well as serving as docents, production assistants, stage managers, tech and ushers, along with our team of professionals, we have probably touched everyone in the school and they have touched us. This is truly a special place. We also have a cadre of Sharp, Howard, and Morgan University students serving as festival volunteers this week. And we've held <laughs> HU. And we've held private Q&A sessions with them and the artists and presenters who have been part of our programs. One question came up several times. How could these budding professionals pursue their careers in the face of racism and inequity they will undoubtedly encounter? Well, the very fact that they were asking these questions tells me that they are moving from a place of awareness and courage as they pursue their goals, and that's a good start. But what the presenters said, what they have demonstrated in their work, and what we have seen in the example of those same icons and foot soldiers of the movement is that growing skill and excellence is what we, in what we do comes first. No need to anticipate racism is there. Better to turn toward the gifts we are developing and keep offering them to the world. Be unstoppable in that. I see that in this school. I see that in my colleagues. I have seen it all week in the people who have graced our festival stages and in the many virtual offerings we have online, which by the way, will be running for an additional encore week on our website. As Maya Angelou said, pursue the things you love doing and do them so well People can't take their eyes off you. Here's to being downright irrepressible. Thank you. Good evening. Welcome to the March on Washington's Film Festival, right here at Duke Ellington School of the Arts. My name is Sandy Logan, and I have the privilege of serving this community as the principal. First, 
I would like to say a special thank you to Mrs. Isara Bay and her team for shepherding our students this week, for giving them creative opportunities through the virtual salons, covering documentaries and AI animation. But in addition to the, in addition to the creative process, Ms. Bay and her team support our young people through the technical pieces, through the operational pieces, even tonight allowing our young people to provide sound and lights. And so for that, we are grateful. Thank you. Now, the theme of this year's festival is pulpit protest and power. The interesting intersection is right here at Duke Ellington. Our students during their social studies curriculum engages in an initiative called arts as activism. During the civil rights movement, our young people learn about legislation, Brown versus the Board of Education, the leaders, John Lewis, MLK, but they also learn about the great artists that gave their time and talent. Mahala Jackson, the Staple Singers, Nina Simone. Here at Ellington, we know that it is not a coincidence that they all got their start in the church, pulpit to power. Here at Ellington, we know that making a joyful noise can and will penetrate the hearts and minds of the masses, which is why we know and are grateful for tonight to connect with the larger community that understands that the character that fuels the art is critically important. That also understands that access for all students to the arts is critically important. And a space for voice, for voice of marginalized communities, because it's through our arts that we create a space at the table. So tonight, we give gratitude, for we know we stand on the shoulders of giants and we are grateful for this space. And so we continue to march on. Thank you. Many of the members of the civil rights movement of the mid 1950s to late 1960s were college students and young people. Following the example of local leaders, they brought their passion for equality into the nonviolent fight for racial justice. Dr. King, Ralph Abernathy, John Lewis, Jesse Jackson, Fred Shuttlesworth, C.T. Vivian, and many more were organizers who were also ordained ministers. Some later became elected officials. To tell us more about the beginning, let us bring to the stage the senior pastor of Mount Enon Baptist Church in Maryland, Reverend Delman Coates. Good evening. I certainly want to thank the March on Washington Film Festival for this invitation tonight. And certainly I want to acknowledge the members of the Mount Enon Baptist Church who are here tonight. Thank you for your support. Pulpits, protest, and power. Some of you will remember the 2007 investigation by the Senate Finance Committee into the management and financial practices of some of the most popular televangelists in the country. The inquiry focused on what some senators regarded as significant violations of the nonprofit status of some of America's most notable Christian preachers. For the senators, their nonprofit, their for profit theology seemed to be a contradiction to their nonprofit status. But while the committee was concerned about the nonprofit status of these preachers, I found myself concerned about the nonprofit status of a different sort. They were concerned about their nonprofit PROFIT status, but I was concerned about their nonprofit PROPHET status. In his book, Where Have All the Prophets Gone? Dr. Marvin McMickle writes Prophetic preaching in the American pulpit has suffered a decline in the last 20 to 25 years. 
What has happened, he asked, to the legacy of Vernon Johns, Martin King Jr., Howard Thurman, Sam Proctor, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., and James Lawson? Where are the successors to Richard Allen, Nanny Helen Burroughs, Fannie Lou Hamer, and Prathia Hall Wynn? Why are more saints, he writes, in, more interested in feeling good than doing good? in getting their praise on than getting schools improved, eradicating poverty, and getting more black men into school and out of prison. Forty years ago, the American church saw its mission as saving the soul of America. Now the mission of our churches has become bless me, my family, my kids, and no one else. The demand for justice has in too many instances been replaced by a demand for riches. The preoccupation with prosperity, the worship of worship, and the search for self-gratification has led to the abandonment of the prophetic tradition of social change in favor of a pathetic tradition of consumerism, consumption, and commercialism. The question posed by McMickle confronts us today as we spotlight a generation of black clergy in the 1950s and 60s who led not just churches, but also led the nation by being firmly rooted and grounded in the ontology of African spirituality and the theological tradition of the black church. Now, by the black church, I do not mean all churches of blacks. The black church for me refers to that subset of African-American Christianity that was on the side of the fight for freedom, justice, and equality. Therefore, every church of blacks was not and is not a part of the black church tradition of freedom fighting. Preachers in the black church tradition of the 50s and 60s understood ontologically that bondage and oppression are antithetical to the heart and the will of God. This is why they found the book of Exodus so appealing and why they sang freedom songs with the refrain, and before I'd be a slave, I'd be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. This is why these black preachers rejected the spirit and the hermeneutic of the slave Bible, a version of the Bible that was actually produced and given to blacks by white missionaries with all of the liberation passages edited out of it with hopes that it would encourage black people to remain docile and to spiritually justify oppression. It was that kind of sacred refusal that informed the Afro-Christian hermeneutic of black Christians like Howard Thurman's grandmother, who when asked what she thought about passages in the Bible like slaves be obedient to your masters, responded, that's not in my Bible. As New Testament scholar Dr. Vincent Wimbush told us in his book, African Americans and the Bible, the freedom struggle for black people was never fought and won because black people fetishized the book. Instead, they went to the book to find the God who was behind the book, above the book, and in front of the book to lead us to freedom. That freedom tradition is the tradition that was internalized and handed down to us by the black church prophets of the 1950s and 60s. Prophets, male and female, who led the church and helped redeem the soul of America. They understood that the biblical mandate of the preacher as outlined in Micah 6, 8 is to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. And what made their preaching so powerful was that it was theologically grounded, ethically oriented, and sociologically framed in an effort to deconstruct systemic economic racism in America. They were guided by the firm conviction that justice and, and the God of justice were on their side. Dr. King described this sense when he said that the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice, that God is on the side of justice, that God is on the side of the oppressed, 
that God takes sides in time and in history and that God sides with the marginalized, the maligned and the oppressed inspired them to keep marching, to keep rallying, to keep insisting and to keep going to jail until justice rolled down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing stream. Their vision of justice was one in which they fought for just policies, fair exchanges, and equal access. We see that advocacy in the freedom budget that A. Philip Randolph, Bayard Rustin, and Dr. King and the other clergy fought for in 1966. Their prophetic imagination was informed by the social gospel of the 19th and early 20th century Protestantism, the progressive economic populism of the mid 20th century, and an economic vision for the country that embraced the role of government in eliminating poverty and joblessness in America. Their economic vision was not the economic neoliberalism that has become popular since the 80s with Reagan, in the 90s with Clinton, and has become acceptable today where the role of government is delegitimized, corporations are allowed to capture public supports for, for their own private purposes, and individuals are left to fend for themselves. We hear this economic vision for the country when we listen to Rustin's 10 demands of the March on Washington, read at the end of the march. When we hear Dr. King's prologue to the freedom budget that he wrote a few years later. It becomes clear that they were inspired by a vision of economic abundance rather than scarcity, sufficiency rather than austerity. That if we have money for war and bullets and bombs in the Vietnam War, then we also ought to have money for jobs and health care and housing right here at home. No investigations in the, into these preachers were not opened because of their private planes, their flashy clothes, and their lavish homes. They were investigated because they fought for the least of these, the Lord's children. I mean, think about it. Just a day after returning home from Norway in December 1964, after winning the Nobel Prize for Peace, Dr. King and others joined a picket line in Atlanta's Scripto Pen Factory, where 700 workers were striking for better wages. They were just built differently than so many who occupy today's pulpits. In the, in the speech to fellow clergy at New York's Riverside Church on April the 4th, 1967, King said, we must undergo a radical revolution of values, a shift from a thing-oriented society to a person-oriented society. And that lets us help, that ought to help us to understand that we should not overly romanticize the public receptivity of preachers like King, Wyatt T. Walker, Prathia Hall, William Augustus Jones, Billy Kyles, Gardner Taylor, and others, by whites or by blacks. This same cadre of clergy that we celebrate tonight in this penultimate event, pulpits, protest, and power, were ostracized in their own time. There were no annual banquets in their honor. There were no politicians and members of Congress holding annual breakfasts in support of their cause. Quite to the contrary, they were kicked out of the National Baptist Convention. The NAACP opposed their outspokenness against the war in Vietnam. And their movement was systematically brought down by the powers that be. So as I close, we thank the March on Washington Film Festival for inviting us here tonight to remember the great legacy of these great pulpiteers, prophets, and activists because we are standing on their shoulders and we are walking through doors that they opened. They taught us something about the capacity to endure in the face of adversity. It is how we got over. 
It is how we have come this far. We found a way to look to the hills from whence cometh our help, realizing that our help comes from the Lord. It got us through slavery. It got us through Jim Crow. It got us through inflation in the 70s. It got us through Richard Nixon. It's got us through Reaganomics, and it will help us overcome 45. They teach us that adversity is not the time to abandon the faith. Adversity is not the time to abandon the heritage and the values that got us thus far. Because our tradition reminds us that this is not the first time that we have faced systemic racism. This is not the first time we have faced public lynchings. This is not the first time that we've had to deal with the devaluation of black bodies and black life in the public square. And if we got through it before, guess what? We can do it again. God bless you. Let's keep the struggle alive. And now, performing a musical interlude, the Duke Ellington School of the Arts Concert Choir.
The leaders of the movement in the mid 20th century were a part of a lineage of organizing that forms the foundation for today. Our next presenter shares her expertise as a contemporary activist minister in this country and the connection to justice movements internationally. Here now is the theologian, journalist, and founder of Urban Cusp, Minister Rahil Tesfamarium. Long live the undying spirit of Harriet Tubman. Long live the undying spirit of Fannie Lou Hamer. Long live the undying spirit of Ella Baker. Long live the undying spirit of Dorothy Height, Audrey Lord, Athene Shakur, Maria McCaba, Winnie Mandela. Long live. Thank you for this honor, for ensuring a woman's voice, an African woman's voice, a hip hop influenced voice, a millennial voice. I know that freedom fighters operate in a tradition and believers operate in a tradition and women operate in a tradition and black women operate in a tradition. And a tradition of our bodies being a living sacrifice, a tradition of fighting for black life from the womb to the tomb. A, tradi a tradition of radical inclusion. When black women come into the room, we bring everybody with us. Because freedom is about freeing not only us, but our sisters, our brothers, our lovers, our children and their children. Today, this generation of freedom fighters rejects toxic masculinity, rejects homophobia, rejects poor phobia, and combats the love affair between white supremacy and capitalism. We are a generation of abolitionists, and we seek to abolish the war on drugs. We seek to abolish the new Jim Crow. We seek to abolish police brutality today as always. Yes, we do still love black men. We support black men. We fight for black men. But, but, we refuse to be silent. We refuse to play nice. We refuse to stand in the shadows of patriarchy waiting for our turn. The movement and the church must stretch. It must stretch its understanding of womanhood, stretch its understanding of our value, and stretch its understanding of who we are, who we have always been, and who God is calling us to be. Today, we are in need of a radical theology and a radical imagination, a 21st century image of Christ. An image of Christ that speaks to single mothers, but also to dope dealers. Speaks to black Americans, but also to Africans speaks to anybody and everybody seeking to be made whole and free. A movement that is not inclusive is a dying movement. A movement that is not relevant is a dying movement. And a movement that is not global is a dying movement. I've been to Darfur, I've been to Haiti, I've been to Ferguson, I've been to Palestine, Johannesburg, and Cuba. I've been all over this world. And everywhere I've ever been, theology and activism are not bound to the church. They are not bound to organizations or bound to funding traumatized people are simply creating strategies for survival. And if black lives matter, then gay lives matter. 
If black lives matter, then trans lives matter. And if black lives matter, then poor lives matter. And if black lives matter, then imprisoned lives matter. We don't get to pick who we save. The modern struggle is about land ownership, it's about access to water, it's about ending food apartheid, not food deserts, right? It's about ending pollution and infestation, it's about free health care, it's about physical and mental health. It's a rejection of the borders that European men put between us that has led to the xenophobic attacks that we see in places like South Africa. It's about economic migrants fighting each other over limited resources and limited housing. Today, just as our ancestors did, subjugated people are asking, how long will Pharaoh oppress us? But now more than ever, we understand our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Our struggle has always been a spiritual one. Sadly, many in my generation are rejecting their spiritual inheritance. They're rejecting the church. They're rejecting Christ. And therefore, they are rejecting a freedom that liberates not only here, but in the everlasting. And this is where there is power in reclaiming liberation theology for a new emerging generation. It looks like Bree Newsom climbing up to take down the Confederate flag. It looks like Cole Arthur Riley using social media to reclaim black liturgies. It looks and sounds like Kendrick Lamar telling an entire generation, we gonna be all right. It is the spiritual battle cry of people in the streets who want to know Jesus for themselves. And we can and we should give them a glimpse of what walking with Jesus looks like. Our resistance must be a Pan-African struggle that understands how police brutality in Minnesota relates to state violence in Paris and Brazil and links to crimes against humanity all over the globe. For centuries, black people have been connected through our homeland in Africa, but also through an unwavering belief that God loves us, the black people of the world, the oppressed people of the world, the rejected people of the world. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. I pray for the freedom fighters in this room. I pray for the women in this room, and I pray for the believers in this room. I pray that you would refuse to play small. I pray that you would refuse to dim your light, refuse to limit your imagination, refuse to do what you see on TV and social media, but that you would envision a world that has yet to be born. Ask yourself, the most important question I have ever asked myself, why does the enemy hate me so much? Why has the enemy cared so much about me? Why has the enemy sought to destroy me? Why have I been so traumatized? Too often we measure our value by our success by our productivity because we believe the lies that capitalism tells us that unless we're working, unless we're laboring, unless we are doing things to put money in the pockets of others, then we don't have value. But I'm here to tell you that your greatest value comes with your intimacy with suffering. How well do you know suffering? To measure the depths of who you are 
reclaim that story of suffering. There's a reason that you grew up the way that you did. There's a reason that you understand the meaning of resilience, and there's a reason that you're still alive unlike the people that you buried. You have work to do in this world, and the enemy will do anything and everything to steal your joy, kill your hope, destroy your sense of purpose. And the enemy is not just Satan or Lucifer, Sometimes the enemy comes in the form of media that loops black death over and over and over again, telling you your life doesn't have value. And then it regurgitates the same message when you see non-indictments in the courts. Every single element of the system tells us our lives do not have value. And that is the lie that we internalize every single day. So I'm part of a generation that says, keep your meek Jesus to yourself. Keep that Jesus to yourself. Give me that Jesus that was a political prisoner. Oh, give me that Jesus that was killed by the state. Give me that Jesus that was buried by poor single women of color. Woo! Give me that Jesus. This generation needs that Jesus. If my Jesus can't walk with me in the streets of Ferguson, if my Jesus can't put on a kufiya in Gaza, And if my Jesus doesn't know that apartheid still exists in South Africa, then I don't want that Jesus. I believe that Jesus has a message for this generation. That message is very simple. The time is now, black woman and black girl. The time is now, black man and black boy. The time is now. The time is not tomorrow. It's not in the future. It is today. It is today. It is present. It is here. It is in this moment. And I promise you, more than anything else, they speak of justice. They speak of mercy. They speak of God's grace. But I leave you with this. The wrath of God is on our side. Thank you. Now please welcome Patrick Lundy and the Ministers of Music. Thank you. 
on, is that your testimony tonight? Come on, where is the church tonight? Is that your testimony? That my heavenly father watches over me. How many of you know he's a way maker? Come on, let the redeemer of the Lord say so. How many of you know he's a way maker? Hallelujah. Come on. Come on, put your hands together. Come on, stand to your feet if you can and sing this song with us. Stand to your feet if you know that God's a way maker. Hallelujah.
Yes, Lord.
The deaths of Trayvon Martin, Michael Brown, Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, and others continue to demonstrate the necessity for organizing and speaking truth to power from the streets to the ballot box. What do the next several decades hold for our emerging generation of activists? What problems do they face? And what new strategies might they employ? To give us a vision into the future, here is the pastor of St. Luke African Episcopal Church in New York, Reverend Stephen A. Green. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to be able to share this historic and monumental moment with each and every one of you. I want to thank the entire team here at the March on Washington Film Festival for the invitation to come and to share on this auspicious occasion. It is true that our hearts have been lit on fire tonight. We've been ignited with the music of the Duke Ellington School of the Arts, the Patrick Lundy Ministers of Music Choir, and by the powerful words of the Reverend Dr. Delvin Coates and Reverend Rahel Tesfamarin. I'm indeed a privilege and honor to share with you tonight about the future. Because we know that this year marks the 50th anniversary of hip hop. It tells the story of an emergence of a new art form that emerged out of radical disruption. Before there was little baby, da baby, or any baby. Before there was J. Cole and Meg the Stallion, there was a sister by the name of Cindy Campbell who asked her brother Clive Campbell, now known as DJ Cool Herc, if he would play at her birthday party. It was there on August the 11th of 1973 while playing the disco records that he disrupted the sound by skipping a beat. And he invented a new art form that shifted the universe. And every now and then we must disrupt in order to shift, in order to birth something new, in order, in order to bring a renaissance like Beyonce is bringing to the world. We got to learn how to disrupt. Perhaps that is what God was saying to God's self in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, when God says, And the Lord God formed humankind out of the dust of the ground and breathed into their nostrils the breath of life, and humankind became a living soul. It is through disruption out of chaos that God spoke the words, let there be, and there was. And when we examine where we are in our nation today, we find ourselves in a very similar reality. Darkness and chaos hovers over the deep. There's a lot of chaos around us. There's chaos around us when we have 5% of the world's population in the United States, but yet hold 20% of the prison population. There's chaos. There's chaos when we see the erasure of women's reproductive rights after a Supreme Court decided to reverse a 50-year precedent. There's chaos. There's chaos when books who are written by black authors are banned in school because of the fear of telling the truth about white supremacy and our dark past. There's chaos. There's chaos when we find ourselves living in a society where we don't have clean water in Flint, Michigan, and Jackson, Mississippi, all because we refuse to acknowledge the realities of climate catastrophe. There's chaos. The reality is, what do we do? How do we respond in the midst of chaos and catastrophe? What do we say in the face of such nihilism and pessimism that relegates us to the death and destruction because of the failure of this American project in the midst of this chaos? We must be like the creator and get our hands dirty once again. We are amongst a generation of disruptors. It is this generation of love warriors like Coco Golf that disrupted the U.S. Open and defeated all odds to win her first Grand Slam. 
This is a generation of disruptors full of people like Shakari Richardson, who disrupted the World Athletics Championship and is the fastest woman in the world. This is a generation of disruptors. Like my dear brother, Representative Justin Jones in Tennessee, who disrupted the state assembly for protesting to end gun violence. But they did not know that they can expel him on a good Friday. But by Easter Sunday morning, he would have the votes to be reinstated in his rightful seat as the representative of the 52nd district in Tennessee. This is a generation of disruptors. And I want to encourage you tonight to let you know how we're going to move forward in the midst of this catastrophe, what the future will look like, and the future holds for a generation of disruptors to reimagine the ruins. It was God's self who realized that out of dust that he could create something good. Out of what others had rejected, he found that they could be the chief cornerstone. Out of what the nihilism and decay and frustration that we see now, we are going to have to look and reimagine the ruins. Reimagine a new society. Reimagine a new Congress. Reimagine a new form of government. Reimagine a new America. Not only must we reimagine the ruins, we must also receive the restoration. As God formed humankind out of the dust of the ground and put his hands on it and, and, and got dirty with it, then, then the text says that the, the spirit breathed into humankind and, and, and breathed into their nostrils. And I want to encourage us because the future might seem dark. The, the future might seem devastating. It might seem uh, full of despair because we, we, we realize that there's so much work to do that when we think we have accomplished one thing, we find ourselves having to fight again. When we think we have made it so far, when we think that we have accomplished so much as a generation now that we've got billionaires and yet we still have more poverty today than we've ever had in our society, it can get frustrating. Denialism can grow. It can get overwhelming turning on the news. It can get frustrating scrolling down Instagram and seeing another black body become a hashtag. But we must receive the restoration that comes from the divine breath of God that wants to let us know that rest is a form of resistance. To let us know that even on the seventh day, the Lord rested, that we must rely, realize that we must be renewed for this journey ahead, that you are not God. And if God found time to rest, then even you should. You ought to learn to take some time for yourself, to have a day for yourself, just for me, myself, and I. And when you receive restoration, when we reimagine the ruins, then we can move from renaissance to revolution. Because the Spirit says that uh, once they breathed into the nostrils uh, and, and, and gave them life, then it says that humankind became a living soul. And when you become a living soul, you embrace the power of soul force. That radical philosophy that Jesus believed in that disrupted the temple and turned over the money changers, that soul force that embodied, that was embedded and embodied within Harriet Tubman that freed 300 slaves with armed resistance, that soul force that was in Frederick Douglass that said, I prayed for 20 years and received no answer until I prayed with my feet. When we become a living soul, we're able to take up our rightful place as the revolutionary generation. Revolution will not skip this generation because I, I've seen the lightning flash. I've heard the thunder roll. I felt sin breakers dashing trying to conquer my soul. But still, I heard a small voice from heaven saying to steal, fight on. The spirit promised never to leave me. Never to leave me alone. It's time to move from renaissance to revolution.
She is one of the best-selling gospel artists of all time. Having sold over 10 million albums worldwide, she has won four Grammy Awards, four Dove Awards, five BET Awards, six NAACP Image Awards, six Soul Train Music Awards, two M. Two BMI Awards and 16 Stellar Awards. She is the first gospel artist to be awarded an American Music Award. And she is also an actress, a rousing speaker, and a host of her own nationally syndicated show. We are exceedingly proud to bring to the stage our special guest artist, Yolanda Adams. Hello. How are you all? Good. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Oh, I love you too, Miss Rita. That's that's my like Miss Rita right there, y'all. Oh. I get excited about life, especially, you know, doing what I do and going all over the world and trying to help people understand their power in God. Sometimes people are like, yeah, but that works for you. And I'm like, no, it works for all of us. All you have to do is believe. ups and downs can turn those pretty smiles on your faces into ugly, ugly, ugly frowns. It seems that when I fix one thing, another one comes, clouding up my vision, but I can feel the sun. I believe that I can do this. I know that I can win. As long as I
must believe that he made me in his likeness and his image. I gotta believe that he loves me so. He loves me so. He loves me so that he would never Mr. Rodney East, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, sir. Something about y'all air down here, up here. Give Dr. Rick, uh, Reggie a hand. <laughs> Thank you, sir. To the rescue. Yeah, so it's just that simple. I just got to believe what he said about me. And you've got to believe what he said about you. That you're the apple of his eye. He runs to your rescue. He's there before you call. He knows before you pray. It's like, it's just so simple, but people make him so hard. And he's not hard and he's not pressing. He's not any of those things that people make him. So it's my job to go all over the world looking cute in clothes and clothes and tell them that he's just a prayer away.
So cool, you know. Just call his name. He'll be there right away. Got some witnesses in the building. You know, life has its ebbs and flows, and it goes and it comes, and it just sometimes it's like a real cool sailing on the sea of your love kind of thing then it's like oh god what's going on but if you stay in the mindset that in you god has already placed the power to overcome anything any obstacle any trial any just anything because what god does is he deposits himself in us to handle whatever it is we're dealing with. And don't you know that he already knew that all of this stuff would come, so he equipped you with every tool and talent you needed to get through whatever. I'm like, that gives me so much encouragement that I am not alone because there's definitely someone watching over me. Oh, y'all like that one, huh? All the cool people snap your hands. You say that you're not afraid. You're just fine. You got it all figured out. And all of the plans you made, you made, you made, they'll work out. But deep inside you have your doubts, but you're clinging to your pride. And you just don't know you're free. Pray. 
<laughs> that you'll never find love that way again. And why should you take a chance, a chance, chance to fall? But you'd rather build a wall than believe that you are loved. Open up your heart, cause someone needs you. Testimony about how God watched. 
watched over me. There were times when I thought that I could not make it. Times I thought that I could not take it. But he helped me, helped me, kept me, helped me. The things I thought I wouldn't get through, he made sure that I got through. The things I thought I wouldn't get through, he made sure that I got through. Not only did he take me through, not only did he take me through, not only did he take me through, buddy, 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 buddy. Made a way out of nowhere. Made a way out of nowhere. Made a way out of made a way out of made out of way to made out of way. Made a way out of made out of way. Made a way out of no way. Made a way out of no way. Made a 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 made a way. 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 I didn't need to know. He knew. I didn't need to know 'cause he knew. I didn't need to know 'cause he knew. I didn't need to know 'cause he knew. So I just walk by faith and not by sight. I walk by faith and not by sight 'cause he's watching over me. And if he did it for me, he will do the same for you. Yes, he will. He'll do the same for you. Y'all give the band some back there, 'cause they did that. All right, band. 'Cause I wish I could tell you that was a part of the set. Never. Ooh, 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 ooh. He's got you. 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 Oh, I don't know who you are, but you keep pulling, and God just keeps saying, "He's got you. He's got you. He's got you. He's got you." You got to trust Him. Trust and obey, 'cause there is. No other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Trust and obey, 'cause there's no other way to be happy, 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 happy in Jesus. Trust and obey. I've seen. The lightning flashing, and I've heard the thunder roll. Felt sin breakers dashing, 
trying to conquer my soul, but I heard the voice of the Savior saying final, and cause he promised never to leave us, never to leave us alone, he promised never to leave us, never to leave us alone, never. Just to me and you, I feel so lost, cause I don't know what I'm gonna do, what if I choose the wrong thing to do, I am so afraid of, afraid of disappointing you. So I need to talk to you and ask you for your guidance, especially this day when my life seems so cloudy. Guide me until I'm sure I open, open the mind.
I'm sure I open up my heart. Yes, I do so. Show me how to do things your way. Don't let me make the same mistakes over and over. so sweet. Thank you. Oh, Lord. You, you said it, yeah. Now, y'all gonna have to sing with me. Well, I would like to ask the choir to come on out and help me with this one.
<laughs> My granny would say it like this. I'm going to run on and see what the end is going to be. If he kept me, if he's kept me, if he's kept me for 62 wonderful years. To keep me for 62, 62 more, 62, 62 more, 62, 62 more. And I, I would not trade my life, I would not trade my life, I would not trade my life for nothing. Oh, cause I've seen him be a battle axe. I have seen God. Mover, I sing God be a heavy load shepherd. everything to me everything to me yes he is 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 Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's time for me to go, cuz.
behalf of all our performers, the Ellington students, and faculty yes, and thank staff, you and the March on Washington Film Festival, we are so privileged to have you here. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, students, running this tonight. Thank you, Yolanda Adams. Oh, my Lord, how could I forget that? Ministers of Music, Desa Concert Choir, all of our preachers, and most of all, all of you. We got the word tonight in dance, in song, in speech. God bless you. Good night.